All right, can you guys hear me okay? Good, good, good. So my name is uh, Joshua Hubbard. I am a, an audiologist and assistant professor of otolaryngology at the University of Miami Ear Institute. Uh, I lead the vestibular team there. So I, uh, we, see, uh, we do full diagnostic vestibular evaluations across the lifespan. And outside of vestibular, I'm solely a pediatric audiologist. So doing um, any kind of diagnostic audiological testing, um, I fit uh, traditional amplification, bone anchored amplification um, on kiddos birth well through 18. So um, my big focus area is uh, working specifically uh, with pediatric balance, in particular working with the zero to five population, which is not something that's super common um, across sites. So a lot of people will, um, pediatric vestibular programs are growing every year and the interest in the subspecialty of audiology seems to be gathering more and more interest, but um, very few sites are not really focusing on this sort of earlier, earlier years. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So some objectives for today, identify some risk factors commonly associated with vestibular dysfunction in children, formulate questions to include in case history specific to vestibular dysfunction, and then possibly integrating two to three vestibular screening measures in a diagnostic audiologic or um, otologic evaluation uh, test battery uh, to really see what the reflexes mediating balance function are doing. Disclosures. So I know that everybody sort of has different training and um, there are multiple different specialties that are encompassed within these lectures. So I thought I would do just a little bit of review, but maybe from a different viewpoint. So as we know, the balance system is composed of five organs in each ear that help to do a variety of things uh, that contribute to equilibrium. So both in a linear um, and in an angular uh, acceleration plane, looking at the semicircular canals and the otolith organs. So interestingly enough, we know that we sensate vestibular input by about five to six months post gestation. So uh, it is one of the first sensory systems to start responding. Um, and it is, uh, it, is, it is very much doing that by five to six months of age. So a lot of that input that the, the mother is receiving from walking, from being acted upon by her environment, the infant is feeling that too. Um, we know that this system is functional at birth. Um, and we know that there's a critical period for vestibular development. So this critical period is something we're much more familiar with on the hearing side of things, where we know that if we're not able to get adequate auditory input to that child by about one to two years of age, the likelihood that they'll be able to meet those auditory developmental milestones of their normal hearing peers decreases even more so after seven years of age, because a lot of those cortical pathways have already organized themselves, rearranged themselves for what input it is receiving regularly. Well, similarly, there's very similar literature. It's a very small body of literature um, regarding vestibular function, but really what they say here is that if these very basic foundational processes meeting balance are not in place by one to two years of age, some of the more complex balance functions, things like vestibular cognition, bodily consciousness, uh, spatial and visual mapping, um, all of these more complex processes may not develop adequately or may not develop at all. So it's really essential that some of these more foundational aspects of balance are in place very early in life. And then we know that reflexes reach peak development by about 12 years of age, and that's largely to facilitate the development of emerging motor skills and postural control. So in other words, if these very basic foundational reflexes aren't in place that are driven by the balance system or the, the balance more, uh, part of the ear, uh, a lot of these gross motor, complex gross motor skills won't develop. Things like skipping, jumping, walking, et cetera. So how common is this? So O'Reilly and crew, uh, O'Reilly is now at CHOP, um, but was previously at DuPont Children's in Delaware. They, he and his uh, crew did a retrospective review based upon ICD-9 codes related to vestibular disorders and associated chief complaints. They looked at about 560 pediatric patients, birth to 18 years of age. And they found the prevalence to be roughly less than 1% of the population. So it doesn't seem like a whole lot there. Uh, there were several limitations with this study, uh, primarily because um, vestibular disorders and associated complaints are more challenging in children because they're not able to readily communicate the complexity of that language or those symptoms to the doctor or their parents for that matter. So then Lee et al. in 2016 did a retrospective review based on encounters involving dizziness across several ENT departments, 11 to be exact. 
and that encompassed about 11,000 pediatric patients, three to 17. Now they found the prevalence to be about 5.3%. Uh, the benefit here was that they went a little bit more general with dizziness as sort of a cheap or as sort of an encounter. Um, and uh, again, they found it to be a little bit higher. Brodsky and crew, uh, he directs the balance program at Boston Children's. They did a cross-sectional analysis based on encounters involving complaints of dizziness or imbalance as indicated on the National Health Interview Survey in 16. And they, that encompassed about 3.5 million pediatric patients, again, keeping that same three to 17 years. And they found the prevalence to be about 5.6%. So again, pretty similar to what Lee et al. found. So I decided to take this prevalence and sort of look at the population here in Miami. And keeping that you know, nationally weighted prevalence to be about five to 6%, I applied these statistics not only to our pediatric program at the University of Miami Ear Institute, but I also applied that to the, the major children's hospital here in Miami. Um, I should probably explain that we're a little bit unique in that um, at the Children's Hearing Program at University of Miami Ear Institute, we manage most of the children in Central and South Florida because Miami Children's or Nicholas Children's, which is the major children's hospital here, does not do any kind of management for children. So essentially, once they're diagnosed, if they're diagnosed there at all, they're then sent to us and we take care of all the management, whether that be traditional hearing aids, bone anchor devices, or cochlear implants. So at the University of Miami Ear Institute, we saw about 4,000 children in 2018 and applying that statistic about 5.3%, that would equate to about 200 of our kids which likely had vestibular dysfunction. Now keep in mind, we're still looking at a very broad population here. Um, and I would argue that in, in, in this situation, our prevalence is probably higher because we know that there's a higher incidence of balance dysfunction amongst children with permanent hearing loss. Um, and that's in majority of the patients that we see. So I would estimate that our prevalence is probably higher than this, but this is kind of applying that statistic to that number. Now, Nicholas Children's between outpatient, inpatient, and throughout all satellites saw about 510,000 children in 2017. And that would equate to about 25,000 children, which likely had vestibular dysfunction. Now, again, those, those those weighted prevalences may be a little bit higher depending on the clinic you're looking at. So obviously in an otology, ENT, audiology clinic, you're probably going to see those numbers be higher. And in specialty clinics where children are potentially multiply involved with a, with a number of different specialties there. So what are some risk factors that are uh, associated with balance? So one of the biggest ones is sensory neural hearing loss. In Cushing and Crew up at Toronto Sick Kids. Um, they actually argue that about 85% of uh, children with sensory neural hearing loss have some form of balance impairment. Um, and that's likely sort of mediating from the fact that that inner ear is already compromised as a result of the hearing loss. Now, certainly as the degree of hearing loss increases, so you move into that severe to profound range, that likelihood for uh, underlying balance uh, association is higher. Um, it may be a little bit more mild in some of the children with uh, more of a mild to moderate sensory neural hearing loss, but still that risk factor is there. Delayed gross motor milestones, this is something I look very strongly to in my own clinic. Uh, Kaga and crew, who is a PT, has, have done an, a huge body of research looking at this, and they found that children with vestibular dysfunction are anywhere between two and 18 months more delayed than a typical uh, developing child. Um, and interestingly enough, what they found in their studies was that um, if they looked at three groups, so they looked at a group uh, with sensory neural hearing loss, they looked at typically developing, and then they looked at children with sensory neural hearing loss and, and balance impairment. Um, and interestingly enough, even in the group that had um, just sensory neural hearing loss, um, but not necessarily any obvious indications of balance disorders, they were still delayed when compared to typically developing children um, as far as gross motor development goes. Otitis media with effusion, um, if you work in an ENT or ear practice, this is something you see frequently. And Castle Branton crew had a number of different studies that looked at you know, the impact of, of, uh, of fluid on uh, balance dysfunction. And there's a lot of literature showing that in the presence of fluid, there's an increased likelihood for a balance impairment. And then we generally see that balance impairment improve once the fluid has resolved. But what there's little literature on is whether or not that fluid uh, continues to impact balance with chronic middle ear issues. Um, and I think the biggest challenge there is that we never truly know when 
Maybe the child is in between ear infections, just ending, just starting an ear infection, and so trying to track that very specifically has been challenging. Some other uh, risk factors associated, we know migraine. Um, the crew at Boston Children's, uh, Brodsky in particular, has done a really great line of research where he's looked at uh, tracking um, the potential for migraine from early infancy, and they found a higher prevalence of individuals develop into true migraine um, that began with torticollis as an infant. They were more likely to then have BPP of childhood moving into toddlerhood, and then they were then more likely to be migraineurs as they moved into adolescence. So migraine is something we definitely want to track. Um, another one that we're probably more familiar with is head trauma, so looking at concussion and TBI. This population is a little bit more challenging because oftentimes the balance function uh, from a quantitative standpoint oftentimes does hit back to a normal or baseline measure where we see the biggest challenge with these kiddos is, is looking at focus and attention um, and then really working with an entirely new brain. So we know that particularly with concussion, that sharing action of the brainstem occurs and those connections that were previously very established in the brain now have to sort of rework themselves to figure out what this new normal is and that takes time. Um, and so oftentimes with, with these individuals having a multidisciplinary team involved in that, particularly someone who can do some neuropsych testing to really tease out some of those more cognitive or, um, or uh, frontal lobe uh, issues is really important. Uh, looking at uh, vestibulocochleo anomalies and or syndromic etiologies. Uh, so that's something very familiar, uh, looking at things like charge, um, looking at things like Mondini malformation, et cetera. Um, these are more anatomical structural abnormalities that we can often uh, see and or a disorder that has a known associated vestibular issues, things like Wardenburg, stuff like that. Um, congenitor or acquired uh, infectious diseases. So this is something like CMV. Um, I'm going to show a case with CMV a little bit later in the presentation, but again, uh, there are known associations of that. Uh, meningitis is another one. And then vestibular toxicity, which we see in a lot of our uh, kiddos that are being tracked for various forms of cancer. So what are other possible indicators? And I think these are the more fun ones. These are the ones we're less familiar with. So looking at reading deficits, certainly it's not exclusive to balance impairment, but we find that children with balance impairment are more likely to have reading deficits, particularly in the acute phase of pathology. Um, we see that because of uh, vi visual challenges, oscillopsia, et cetera, um, they're gonna be more likely to have difficulty focusing on the words on the page. Um, reading is also a, a fairly known spatial task and oftentimes children with balance impairment don't have as, as, as strong or as a discrete of an of a ability to uh, detect those different spatial uh, relationships with words and other things on a page. Math, very similar. Math is a very spatially oriented task and uh, one of the things I do with a lot of my kiddos is uh, I'll have them count backwards from 100 um, particularly the older ones, and it's challenging because we forget that we have to picture that number line in our head and be able to see those different patterns that we're looking to pass up to see the next uh, figure that we're looking to find. So in the case of a number line, 100 moving to 98, moving to 96, we're having to picture those spatial relationships of the numbers in order to do that task efficiently, and this is more challenging for children with uh, vestibular dysfunction. Poor spatial and body awareness, um, you know, so these are the kiddos that we, you know, bump into the wall or maybe stumble a little bit more than others, maybe appear very uh, uncoordinated or very clumsy. Um, and a lot of that's just because they have not developed those more complex skills of being able to understand where their body is in a space and how their body relates to that space, but then also how that space is acting upon or relating to their own body. Anxiety and depression, uh, unfortunately, there are not as many studies out there specific uh, to children, but there's a lot, a fair amount of uh, literature that's pointing to an increased uh, a propensity for anxiety and depression in individuals with underlying balance dysfunction. Specifically, uh, it's the challenge of them seeing multiple providers over the course of several years and still not really knowing what's going on um, because this is not an area that a, a number of clinics work with. Poor attention. Um, so again, sometimes it can maybe appear as something else, perhaps like ADHD or um, uh, def a defiance disorder of, of, some, of some form. But in reality, if we think about the cognitive reserve that is required for somebody who has a balance deficit to try to maintain balance, that cognitive reserve is now being uh, 
um, sort of utilized to keep the balance and not there's less cognitive reserve to focus on other things like attention or learning. Um, so we do see that attention is oftentimes impacted negatively because of a balanced dysfunction. Acute or chronic headache or migraine. So again, looking at that trajectory, if we notice that migraines are frequent in a, in a, in a kiddo as, they, um, as they're younger and then move up into adolescence, um, that could be secondary to balance. Um, but we definitely, again, that multidisciplinary approach there is essential, so involving neurology there as well. And then hyper or hypo uh, uh, sensitivity and or tonicity. So again, um, these individuals, because their balance system isn't adequately creating some of those uh, foundational uh, elements needed to achieve some of these gross and, and uh, fine motor development, they may have an underdeveloped core or a, a pretty weak core. Um, they may um, be sensory seeking or require additional sensory input to make up for what the balance system is not adequately processing. And then as we look at a case history, so what are other things we can consider? So birth history, um, I will often ask about uh, the infant's time in the NICU. Um, oftentimes infants that go into the NICU um, are at higher risk for infection. And so many of them do receive a sepsis rule out, uh, which uh, Sanford uh, has shown us that the most common sepsis rule out uh, is looking at a combination of gentamicin and ampicillin, um, which we know gentamicin is quite uh, vestibulotoxic and oftentimes the dosage over the course of time that that infant is getting that is quite high. Um, you know, certainly it's regulated, but we wonder, we have to wonder, does the child in the NICU receiving that treatment, are they at a greater risk for a balance impairment than say a well baby? Medical history, looking at things like torticollis in infancy or toddlerhood, again, that could be per Brodsky's work, a, a precursor to uh, becoming a migraineer later on. Um, other things, history of motion intolerance, uh, you know, that visual vestibular deficit there, staring spells, uh, family history of imbalance or dizziness, recent um, vision examination. I really like to have this with, with my patients that I test um, because a lot of the testing, if I do formal testing with the infant, is done through the eyes. And so essentially, if I have a foggy or steamed window, I don't have a very good lens to which I'm looking at the ear or the balance system to know what it's doing. So I really like to make sure that the vision um, is either corrected with, with prescription lenses or, or contacts um, prior to jumping into that. Audiologic history. So I think it's really important to have a recent hearing evaluation on these kids. Um, there are a number of different uh, pathologies that have both a hearing and a vestibular component. So that may be essential for looking at that differential, particularly if they're reporting hearing concerns as well. Academic and social history, these are also some fun ones. Um, you know, so looking uh, at this list, we, we probably could easily uh, equate this list or associate this list with many other things that we may see in the classroom, things like, uh, you know, a learning difficulty, um, things like ADHD, things like defiance disorder, things like inattention, um, you know, things like even potentially in some cases autism spectrum disorder. So again, the challenge with balance is that it, it may not, it may look like many other things. And so the challenge then is sort of teasing out what it is and what it isn't. Um, but you'll notice, you know, delayed and slow learning, academic strengths and weaknesses, you know, so again, looking at does the child seem to really uh, perform very poorly in math and reading? Um, that could be sort of a, an indication. Uh, are there behavioral concerns? Um, are there concerns for attention or focus? Again, is that cognitive reserve being utilized to maintain balance, leaving them less reserved to be used for attention or focus? And then there's also a, a, a challenge there with, you know, not only are these systems developing, but so are systems like attention and learning and all of these other things. So for a child who is developing, you know, there's a multitude of things happening at once and a, a normal functioning system is pretty good at managing all of those. But a system where there are deficits, it's a little bit more challenging, obviously. Uh, sensory concerns, so are they avoiding uh, sensory input? Are they seeking sensory input or both? And then potential socializations concerns. So do they isolate, you know, do they, uh, children, as I've come to learn over the years are very perceptive and they know when they're different or when something is not the same and they, and they can point it out, you know, so sometimes these children are more likely to, to be isolated on the playground or uh, not as social with other children. 
So I'm going to focus for a minute on just the achievement of developmental milestones, particularly in these little ones. Uh, these are, this is a huge, huge uh, area where I focus. Um, so, you know, are there any concerns with the child's balance or development? This is something I include in my typical audiologic eval. Um, you know, and has your child achieved the following milestones at these, at these levels? Uh, I will say uh, McCaslin created this list and it's a great, you know, reference, but I would say of these four things, parents are generally always very attuned to when their child started walking. They're a little bit less attuned to response to tilt, head control, and sitting unassisted. So um, kind of going along that same pathway there, uh, Janky and Crew in 2018, we're looking at the need for a diagnostic evaluation, uh, whether it's warranted for children with sensory neural hearing loss, uh, just know, knowing that this is, there is a higher prevalence or higher risk factor for balance dysfunction in this particular population. And they actually found through their research that children with a PTA, a pure tone average greater than 66 decibels, who sat later than 7.25 months, who walked later than 14.5 months, and whose parents expressed concerns with gross motor development, these children especially were at uh, greatest risk for balance dysfunction and these uh, having checked all of these or a few of these boxes may uh, further warrant a need for a more uh, in-depth evaluation or in-depth screening approach to really tease out whether or not that balance function is really doing what we expect it to. So these are probably things, uh, if you do work with this population or uh, a balanced population in general, things that we know. We know that we do ocular motility testing, looking at how the, the eye is responding to a variety of different movements or stimuli. Looking at the high frequency head shake, so you know, supercharging that system and seeing if there's any obvious asymmetry. Fukuda step test, so you know, oftentimes, as we know with that, if a patient deviates more than uh, about 30 to 40 degrees, uh, that, that, that is indicative of there being uh, an abnormal spinal input uh, to the side that they turn to. Um, Romberg testing uh, and looking at Dick's Hall Pike maneuver. But I want to give you guys uh, sort of a sneak peek into some other things that I do in my clinic. So um, as you know, uh, there's certainly opportunity to do a more formal vestibular evaluation using things like the rotational chair and VNG and VEMP testing. But I find that in, uh, when I'm working particularly with this zero to five population, uh, while many of them are very compliant uh, and very willing, particularly if you make what you're doing into a game, I find that it's very cumbersome uh, to get them set up into a rotary chair, to get them set up for certain tests. Um, and their attention, as we well know, if you work with children, is often pretty short. Uh, so I tend to really focus on doing comprehensive screenings with this population to really get an idea of whether or not those three primary reflexes mediating vestibular, uh, uh, mediating development from the vestibular system are functional or not. And if not, to what degree of impairment am I suspecting? So I really focus on uh, screening measures that uh, assess the vestibulo-ocular reflex, the vestibulo-spinal reflex, and then the vestibulo-colic reflex. So these are some testings here and uh, there are some screening measures here. And I have videos of what these all look like on children of a variety of different ages. So I'm gonna show those to you now. So the head thrust or head impulse test, this is from Halmiyagi in uh, Australia. And what this is looking at is it's looking at the fast component of the vestibulo-ocular reflex. So what the idea is, is that if we do very small, very quick head impulses, either left or right, uh, and have the patient fixate on a target, let's say a nose or a sticker um, or a, a, a toy, whatever the case may be, a video screen that the family is holding in front of the clinician's face. Um, the idea is that they focus on that and you turn their head left or right with these fast impulses and you shouldn't see the eyes deviate or move with the head. The eyes should stay focused on the target. However, in the case of an underlying uh, balance impairment, particularly of the horizontal semicircular canal, we see that the eyes actually track with the head and then track back to the target. And that's indicative that, that, um, that those, uh, those afferent inputs are not necessarily responding the same. So I'm gonna show you, this is Lennox. Uh, he's a three-year-old. And as you can see, he's very willing to do this. And then I'll show you Antoinette. She's a five-year-old right after. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take your head and shake it like you're saying, no, 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 no. And when I do that, I want you to look at my nose the whole time. Pretend like you have lasers on your eyes and look at my nose, okay? Even when I move your head. Should we try it? Ready? Look at my nose, look at my nose, look at my nose, look at my nose. 
Good job. Look at my nose. Look at my nose. Look at my nose. Good job. Look at my nose. Look at my nose. Look at my nose. Good job. Me, that's you. What's me? Yeah. Moving your. And then this is Antoinette. Your head. Should we try? And move your head really fast, and you just keep looking at my nose like you have lasers on my nose. Okay? okay. All right. Ready? So look at my nose. Look at my nose. And we're going to look at my nose. Look at my nose. Look at my nose. Good. Look at my nose. Look at my nose. Look at my nose. Good. So as you can see, they're very compliant and very willing to do this, and it's fairly quick to do in a clinical setting regardless of where that is. Another one is the single leg stance. So uh, this looks at a variety of um, different spinal inputs. And uh, essentially, there's a, a chart that I'm happy to share offline if you need it. But it, it tracks ages three, four, and then five and up. And the idea is that by three years of age, they should be able to maintain balance pretty easily on one leg for at least two seconds. As they become four years old, they should be able to hold it for about three to four seconds. As they become five years old, they should be able to hold it a little bit longer. And then after five, they should be able to hold it for about 10 seconds or so. Um, and again, we have Lennox here who's three and we have Antoinette who's five. And so you can see the difference in, in sort of how that, that system is becoming more mature even just over a couple of years. Hey, we're gonna go on two legs first. You can't hold on to me though. I can stand behind you, but you can hold on to me. Ready? On the count of three, we're going to go on one leg. Ready? One. Two. Leg. Go. One leg. Two. Three. Good. So as you can see, he's a little bit more unstable, but he was able to do that pretty well for about two to three seconds there. And then Antoinette is very determined to do this well. And then ready? One, two, three. Lift. And let's hold it. One. Two, three, good. Let's try again, we'll do it one more time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, good. So again, by about five years of age, they should be able to do that for about seven to eight seconds. And after five, they should be able to do it 10 plus seconds. So even just looking at how much more uh, unstable or how much more waiver Lennox had versus the Antoinette, and that's just in a two-year difference. So those spinal inputs are becoming much more mature over time. Another is a sort of layman's rotary chair. So uh, this is uh, Joy Bella. She's three. Um, and this is Chloe. She's nine. Um, and uh, what you can see here, the filming of this was a little bit more challenging just because my colleague was, uh, was having a little bit of trouble following me with the camera. Um, but essentially what I'm looking for here is, is the, the vestibulo-ocular response responding the way I expect it to. So essentially, as I turn them in a desk chair, am I seeing the, the fast phase of the nystagmus going towards the side I'm turning? So in other words, as I'm turning to the right, do I see a right beating nystagmus? As I'm turning left, do I see a left beating nystagmus? Again, letting me know that that VOR is functional and responding the way I expect it to. Um, there's a couple different ways you can do this. You can either have the child sit independently and spin the chair and then stop it after a couple seconds and look at their eyes. Or um, in a, a smaller kiddo, you can actually have the parent hold the kiddo's head facing forward. And then uh, you can have someone else spin the chair and then again, stop after a few spins and see what the eyes are doing. So I'll show you both examples of those. Ready? Again, it's a little bit challenging to see because of the... No, I'm not catching up with <laughs> I'm missing you. But you can see there as I'm turning right, you can see her eyes are beating to the right. I don't know if this is even helping. I'm seeing the catch up. And then we'll do the same thing here with Chloe. Now, Chloe one, had just done a few two, other tests for me, three. so she was tired of spinning at this point. So we'll spin and then we'll have them stop. Open, open, and open. you can see, so I'm getting that right beating nystagmus from her there. Ready? Here we go. Uh, the Snell and I chart, uh, so uh, dynamic visual acuity is something that is, is really, really important for, particularly for those uh, individuals with concussion or TBI. This is oftentimes, in most cases, after that first, you know, five to 10 days uh, post-injury, this is usually the test that we'll see abnormalities with because that, uh, that central system is still sort of figuring out what its new normal is. 
Um, and this also contributes to some of those challenges with focusing, with reading, um, and with attention as well. Um, so in this case, what you'll do is nowadays, uh, they often have the smell and eye charts on a digital platform. So uh, something like an iPad or something like that. Um, but in our case, we have the big old school uh, Snell and Eye charts that uh, we were, were very generously donated to us from the ophthalmology department at University of Miami. And um, what I recommend is have two or three of those if you have the old school charts because kids are very smart and they do memorize the lines, uh, the letters on the lines very quickly. Uh, so what I'll do is have them familiarize with one chart and then put a new chart up to actually perform the testing. But in the first video, I'm just kind of explaining. So what they're doing is they see the eye charts and I ask them to read this, the smallest line they can. Uh, and, and then um, we do the same thing basically as I'm moving their head at about 120 beats per second. The idea is that if there's a deficit, that deficit, they will have to read two lines above the smallest line where they saw anything um, greater than two deviations uh, poorer than their initial reading without the head movement is considered abnormal. So in, in the case if, if Chloe were to read the very last line and then not be able to read you know, th until three lines up with the head movement, that would be abnormal and indicative that her dynamic visual acuity is a little bit off. So I'm gonna show you just a little bit about what that so looks like. Are you ready? Here. Here we go. D O V H R. V very good. Can you read a smaller one? Uh, Try the one below, Chloe. O. Good. So it's pretty challenging for them. Um, and Chloe actually, uh, she's never had an injury that we know of, um, but this was definitely challenging for her. She wasn't technically abnormal because she was uh, only able to read the line above where she initially uh, found it without the head movement, but uh, it was definitely a challenging task for her. All right, Chloe, how are you? Um, this is probably one of my favorite tests to do, um, primarily because this is sort of a, a watered down version of posturography. Um, the posturography machines are very expensive for those of you who do work with them and not every clinic has one. We're fortunate to have one, but I tend to use this version because it's a little bit quicker and a little bit easier. So essentially what I'm looking at are four different conditions. So this is called the modified um, sensory uh, or clinical test for sensory integration of balance. And I'm looking at four conditions. So I'm looking at eyes open uh, on a firm surface and eyes closed on a firm surface, and then eyes open on a compliant surface, eyes closed on a compliant surface. And essentially what it's doing is helping us isolate different elements of, that are contributing to equilibrium, uh, both visual, proprioceptive, and vestibular, and how those, uh, how those different systems are, are able to maintain balance both in concert and in isolation. So essentially, you know, the idea is that when we have them on a compliant surface with eyes closed, that's a majority, um, the majority of that input for maintaining balance is coming from the ear because the input coming from spinal is not reliable because it's compliant and mobile. And then they don't have vision because their eyes are closed. So again, the ear is the one that's solely contributing to that. And oftentimes in individuals that have underlying peripheral balance dysfunction, those individuals are uh, often will do very poorly or not either um, have significant sway or fall completely in that condition with eyes closed on a compliant surface. So I'll show you both of those here. Like this. Wow, good job. Good, all right, ready? We're gonna close our eyes, get your balance. Can see our feet a little bit apart. Perfect, perfect, perfect. All right, ready? Do we feel, do we have our balance? All right, we're gonna close our eyes in three, two, one, let's close our eyes. No peeking, no peeking. And hold it really, really still like a second. Close your eyes, close, close your, your eyes. Close your eyes, no peeking. Keep it closed. So as you, you can go. see, she is swaying just a little bit there. And that's sort of knee and ankle joints, but very keep much close. able to almost keep done, her balance. Done. Chloe does the same thing I'm here. Gonna, I'm going to have you stand there and just try to keep your two, three. So eyes are closed. Try to keep your balance. Good, good, good. Try not to move too, too much. You got it, you got it. Oh, so again, able to keep balance pretty well, but we do notice a little bit more sway there. So um, I will say, I saved the best for last. This is my favorite of all the tests to do because I really, really enjoy working with the littles, um, particularly the infants. Um, this is Sada. She actually has congenital CMV. 
Um, she does have a cochlear implant in this video on the left side. Um, and there were, say, she's about 24 months in this video. So there have been significant concerns for her development. Um, she is still not ambulating independently. She has severe to profound sensory neural hearing loss in both ears. Um, she has a pretty robust congenital nystagmus that you'll see here in just a moment. Um, and uh, mom is very, very concerned because she does fall frequently. She cannot ambulate independently. Um, and, you know, she's been in physical therapy, but we're not really seeing the progress there that we'd expect to see. So what I do is I use this sort of physio ball here and I'm looking for a couple different things. Um, by about two to three months of age, they should have a writing reflex. And so essentially as you pitch the infant forward, they should counteract that balance or that, that gravitational pull forward to help protect their face from not plummeting into the ground. And very similarly, as we rock them back, we should see their head rock back to counteract their body going backwards. And as you'll see here with Sada, we don't really see any, any engagement or any activation of that reflex as I roll her both forward on her belly and then back here. So again, we're not really seeing that head arch up to counteract it naturally going down. It just sort of goes right with the ball and she is loving the sensory simulation. So then we can also do the same thing, rolling the infant laterally. And again, when we roll laterally, we should see that there's some catch reflex that occurs. So as she moves to the right, she's probably gonna grab right. As she moves to the left, we expect her to grab to the left side. And again, we're not really seeing much of that. I can then do the same thing as I sit the infant on their, their bottom. And the benefit here is that I'm able to see what their core is doing a little bit more. So as I move them left and right, do they sort of just move like a noodle with, the, with, with their body or do they actually sort of engage the core to counteract that natural inclination of the body to go with gravity? Or excuse me, to go with the trajectory of the movement. Good. All right, let's go forward. <laughs> Notice how her core doesn't engage there in the same way that it does going backwards. So it's nice and engaged here. Like it's, she's trying, she's trying, she's holding it strong. And then it releases, yeah? She's loving it. Then we're gonna bounce, bounce. But even here, look at how her neck isn't quite in center. <laughs> My colleague is translating there. They are a Spanish speaking family. Um, uh, what I'm about to do next is roll her laterally to either side. And again, notice for that catch reflex here. Um, it's a little bit challenging to see, but you can see that as we move her to the left side, we don't really get any activation of that reflex, but then we move her to the right side and we do see her arm go down to catch herself there. So again, no activation, her body would just fall if I didn't hold her. <laughs> And then you see her arm went down on the right <laughs> side there to try to help a little bit. <laughs> so the next thing here. So I also look at subjective observation of gait. So what I want to see here, number one, are they able to ambulate independently? And if so, what does that gait look like? Is it fairly effortful? Um, do they have a fairly wide stance where they're needing additional surface area to counteract what their body is not able to readily respond to in a smaller surface area or uh, in a smaller frame of movement? What is, what is her body doing? Do we see that you know, maybe her, there's a, a, a posterior tilt? Do we see a, you know, a frontal tilt? Um, do we see that her neck is roughly in line with her spine as she's moving, or is it sort of pushing forward? Um, is there core engagement? Do we see reflexive responses or reflect, or, excuse me, reflective or postural adjustments to counteract where her body's maybe not giving her what we expect? So we'll look at that here. <laughs> Implant down. Let's put your ears back on. So tú no ve que ella siempre está tratando ir al derecho. So the really interesting thing with her, I mean, you can see she's obviously very unstable, but um, what I found to be particularly uh, interesting was that when 
she falls, there's no activation of fear. Now, when we typically fall as people, particularly backwards, there's an activation of that limbic system to signal that something's not right, we're at risk for injury, um, or, or we're fearful of falling, and we're not really getting activation of that. And that tells me that that vestibular limbic connection, so the connection between the ear and between the limbic system is not really active or engaging, um, and, and that's a problem. We need that to engage to give her that sort of um, motivation to say, well, I need to catch myself. I need to change something here so I don't get hurt. The Four Mountains test, um, I won't uh, spend a great deal of time showing you the video, but there is a video link here and I'll happily send this presentation uh, to be uploaded and you can look at it on your own time. But it's a really, really great test. It's something that has never really been used for balance before, but it's something I'm experimenting a little bit with in my clinic. Um, but essentially, it's a, it's a test that was created uh, as a, a way to assess pre-dementia or pre-Alzheimer's. Um, so it is a it is a test of allocentric spatial memory, which is a, a function mediated by the hippocampus. Um, and oftentimes they've seen uh, in literature that the hippocampus is the first area of the brain to sort of start showing signs of degradation uh, in the early onset of, of uh, diseases like Alzheimer's and, and dementia. Um, so the benefit of this is that it actually does yield, a, if it is abnormal, it yields a diagnosis of a mild cognitive impairment. But what I find particularly interesting uh, is that it, it's one of very few ways that we can really look at the central vestibular system, uh, in particularly looking at this very sort of complex vestibular uh, task of the brain uh, to, to look at spatial memory. Um, and it's something that we use all the time. If you've ever given verbal directions to somebody, your ability to say, you know what, I'm gonna have you go down first street, make a left on second, go two houses over to the right, uh, and that's, that's where we live. Um, so again, it's, it's asking that individual to transcend themselves from the current space they're in and place themselves you know, in this visual mapping space so they can navigate and give that information to somebody else. Um, and, and that is something that the ear is contributing to. And so what the test does is it shows an individual uh, a picture of a mountain landscape, and they're asked to look at that landscape for a brief period of time. And then they're then shown four pictures of very similar mountain landscapes and asked to, to choose which of the four pictures represents where they previously were in the first picture. So uh, the challenge though is that the, of the four pictures, it's from a different perspective. So not only do they have to see which picture is like that of the one before, but it's a new perspective. So maybe they were standing in front of the mountain before and now they're standing atop the mountain. Can they still recognize that they're in the same space? So their ability to sort of analyze the space and see what that space is like and then be able to uh, place themselves at different, uh, from different perspectives in that space. So it's about 15 uh, trials of this. And then at the end, uh, if they score any higher than an eight, um, or excuse me, any lower than an eight, there that's considered abnormal and that can yield a, a mild cognitive impairment. Um, so it, it's a really interesting test. And again, it's, it's not something that's normed or being used for balance, but um, this, uh, the hippocampus is relatively adult-like by about seven to, to nine years of age. So um, this is something I do um, on, on most of my kids that are of that age. Uh, and it's, it's really interesting to see because I found that in a lot of my kiddos with concussion or TBI, this is often abnormal. So it's, um, it may be some indication of, of that central vestibular system not being quite the same. Now the challenge obviously is that we don't often have a version of this, of this test done prior to the injury happening. So it's sort of a, a bit of a challenge to figure out, is it truly the concussion that caused that or, the, or was it an underlying issue all along? We're not sure. Um, this is something I use pretty frequently in my clinic, um, and in, I, I love it for so many reasons, but it's the ages and stages questionnaire. So the beauty of this is that it's fairly comprehensive. Um, it's a validated developmental and emotional social screening tool for children birth to five and a half. So uh, it is, it is um, and it, it can account for, um, you know, a corrected birth. So if an infant is born prematurely, um, you can actually give them uh, the, the questionnaire that would be appropriate for them versus a child who is typically developing. Um, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes for the family to complete and then about five minutes to score. Um, what I really love is that it draws on the family's in-depth observation of the child. So 
Um, you know, again, in, in these, particularly these littles, they, it, the family is with them very frequently. They're, they're, you know, they're with them day in and day out. They see them grow. They see them achieve these milestones. They see the first word. They see all of that. And so as they see that child develop or perhaps not develop, they're able to make really strong observations about what's, what's going on and what's not going on. And I find that um, particularly with, with families that have multiple children, they're able to compare and contrast. You know, my oldest was maybe doing this about this point, and we noticed that he or she is not. And, you know, we were concerned, but nobody really knows where to send us. So the other really cool thing is that it, it includes a monitoring zone. So if the score yields sort of a borderline, um, it, it allows us to say, you know what, everything looks pretty close to normal now, or roughly, you know, sort of the lower end of normal now, but maybe let's reevaluate or, or reassess that child in about six to 12 months and see if they're, they've exceeded that and they're well within that normal zone, or maybe they've started to fall behind, and then we can provide intervention accordingly or figure out what the next trajectory would be in their, in their plan of care. Um, it's available in six languages, which is great. Um, this allows you know you to use it on multiple patients. I know being in Miami, we have a very high Spanish-speaking population, but we're also a pretty large international hub. So you know we see patients from all over the world, and so this has been really helpful for me, particularly for Spanish, for French, um, and for uh, for Chinese as well. And it can be completed in the clinic waiting room, at home, or via phone. So I have a link here, it's hyperlinked, and, and this kind of gives you a sample questionnaire. The sample questionnaire is for a 48-month-old, but you can kind of see how it's laid out, and it really focuses on assessing development across all, all four domains of, of development. So looking at um, communication, looking at cognition, looking at gross motor, and looking at socialization. Um, and what I really like about that is so many of those are are, are so important and there may be signs of vestibular uh, red flags or vestibular issues in all four of those um, and you know there may be signs for all for for hearing issues in all four of those so I really like that it looks at the total child because balance is certainly you know mediated from the ear but um, involves many contributions from other systems so I really like that it looks at sort of the whole child it also, like I said, leaves plenty of opportunity for the family to comment on various things as well um, from what they've observed in the home or during play. Um, and then, you know, like I said, it, at, at the end, it does allow you to score it. So not only is this great for initial visits, but it's also great to monitor the, the progress over time, particularly if the child were to be um, uh, referred to therapy, um, for specifically vestibular therapy, and we can sort of track um, as they grow, um, particularly in the small kids, because we don't have any questionnaires for littles um, specific to balance and the testing oftentimes, uh, the comprehensive testing is challenging to do after they get, until they get about five or six or so. Um, there is a link here as well for a free, uh, you can essentially have the patient log in um, and fill out all their information here. They can go through and answer all the questions and then they're able to send that link to you to score. And then you can always upload that to their medical chart uh, depending on what the regulations are in your hospital. Um, but I find it's great because if I don't have time during the eval for them to do it on the iPad that I have it on um, or on the paper version I have it on, I have them, I send them the link and say, please just get this to me within the next week and I'll score it and, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll call and chat with the family over the phone about the results. Um, certainly, uh, what about diagnostic testing in, in infant toddlers? You know, I think there's a lot of challenges to consider here, and I think primarily I'm going to kind of focus on those. Um, you know, oftentimes uh, we're very fortunate because we have a full vestibular lab, but many other centers do not. You know, so we look at uh, there may not be equipment available, um, and my goal was to try to make approaches to this sort of early intervention uh, for vestibular uh, feasible and, and approachable for any provider, whether that be an audiologist, an otologist, a, a nurse practitioner, um, a PA, um, you know, a, an early intervention provider, it doesn't matter. Um, I wanted this to be something anybody could, could approach and not feel uncomfortable with. Um, oftentimes, you know, most of the companies don't make a pediatric size goggle. So the challenge here is if the goggle isn't properly fit, that could impact the results of our testing and skew that data. So, you know, we may not be able to reliably interpret that because we'll get a lot of slippage from the goggles as, you know, in this case, if the chair moves. Limited attention and focus. So sometimes the amount of time it takes to get them set up for testing um, and then actually get through the testing can be challenging, but also many of the, of the uh, much of the testing uh, for vestibular involves active participation from the child to be able to contribute. So for example, 
you know, I may task the child, let's sing some Disney songs together, or, you know, let's name all the Disney princesses we can think of, or, you know, can you tell me all the characters um, um, in a certain show? And for some kids, that's really easy. For other kids, they may be with you for the first minute or two and then kind of lose it. So it can be definitely challenging to keep the focus to get really good data um, across a, a, a wide output range of the system. There's really not a lot of normative data to look to. So oftentimes we're looking at adult data and you know, um, sort of taking into account the maturity aspect of the system. Um, there's a lack of provider knowledge and specialization in pediatric balance assessment. So you know, uh, again, they may not have the equipment, but if they do, they may not necessarily know how to use it. Um, limited awareness of the prevalence of balance dysfunction in children. So, you know, as I showed you guys earlier, it's a little bit more uh, prevalent than we, than we think, um, particularly in that population with hearing loss. Uh, poor subjective report from the patient. So again, they're not really able to tell us, you know, tell me about your dizziness. They don't really have the vocabulary to do that oftentimes. And the family is not really sure, particularly if they're not familiar, um, again, how to communicate that to you in a way that is truly um, reflective of what the child is experiencing. The stimuli is impucent. So, you know, a lot of times the, what we use, uh, the stimuli we use for testing is not robust enough to actually provoke the system the way it's provoked in everyday life. So sometimes our ability to interpret what the findings are in, in, in sort of put a, a profile on what they're experiencing functionally may be a little bit challenged. Uh, and then the comprehensiveness or rather lack thereof of the evaluation. So if we spend 25 minutes getting everything set up and then we only get five minutes of testing. Now I only have a little bit of information about one part versus having a, a more comprehensive uh, look at what a majority of the system is doing. So these are just, uh, again, a couple things to consider. I won't spend too much time on this, but um, you know, this is the test battery I kind of utilize in my clinic. So oftentimes zero to two, if I do attempt any uh, objective testing, it's usually rotational chair. Uh, C VEMP, um, which is the cervical VEMP that uh, looks at the saccule function, uh, and then B HIT, which is the um, video head impulse test. So very similar to that bedside test we did, but with V HIT with the goggles, we can actually get the vertical canals too. Uh, three to seven years, we may do V HIT um, and both cervical and ocular VEMP. So ocular VEMP looks at utricular function, and that's looking at a connection between the eyes and the utricle. And then eight years plus, oftentimes we can get the full battery on them. So it really just depends on what you're looking for and where you're suspecting deficits to be. Um, but I, I think at the end of the day, my, my, my job is to get a, a really strong idea of what the function of that system is doing and, and how that may be impacting uh, the child's development. So some takeaways. Uh, screenings are quick and easy to administer and interpret. Uh, it increases and enhances your level of service and value as a provider. So being able to look at some of this may be an additional opportunity um, to get people that may not consider your clinic be in your clinic and also add to the comprehensiveness of, of the services you're providing. And screenings can be easily incorporated into standard hearing evaluation or otologic consultations or any consultation that you're doing to, regardless of your specialty if there is concern there. But I think most importantly, you know, Children with vestibular dysfunction cannot adequately navigate the world around them, very much in the same way that children with hearing loss struggle to interact and engage with the world around them. And in my opinion, I just don't see why this is any less important. And there's some resources here. Again, they're all hyperlinked, some uh, uh, self-report questionnaires. Um, be mindful that most of these questionnaires are normed for ages five to 12 if they're pediatric. And then after the age of 12, we look to the adult uh, outcome measures. Uh, so for example, the Disneyest Handicap Inventory, which many, many are familiar with, that is norm 12 and older, uh, whereas the pediatric uh, Disneyest Handicap Inventory is aged uh, or normed five to 12 years of age. Um, there's also some really great informational tools, uh, in particular, this uh, Balance Problems in Children packet. It's an amazing resource for families. Uh, it really gives a really comprehensive but very easily approached understanding of the balance system and why it's important that it's functioning appropriately. But then what I really like about it is it gives a series of different uh, exercises um, and sort of considerations families can utilize at home to stimulate the balance system uh, during focused engaged play, during daily activities like changing diapers, like cooking, um, like taking out the garbage. It, it has a, a wealth of information and, and uh, is a great resource for you and your family. So I would definitely recommend downloading and taking a look at that. 
And then there is a, a textbook, the Manual of Pediatric Balance Disorders. The second edition actually just came out a couple months ago um, and has some new updates regarding uh, pediatric uh, and vestibular migraine in there. So I wanna end on a really positive note here. Uh, if you guys remember Sada, she's the, the very, uh, very smiley kiddo who is on the physio ball. So I wanted to give you guys an idea of sort of the, what, the work that we do. Um, we completed, I completed the vestibular screening, which is what you guys all saw in March of 2019. And, and my screening largely yielded the following. So her reflexes, again, that VOR, the VSR, and the VCR, median imbalance function, were underdeveloped. Uh, largely speaking, her, her system was underreactive. So, you know, when we were expecting uh, her system to robustly respond to something, it wasn't doing that. Um, and then she was at notable fall risk and increased propensity for head injury, which uh, is obviously a huge problem, um, not only for her safety, but also for the safety of her implant. And then she had poor activation of her vestibulolimbic interaction. So again, that fear response just wasn't there. So I sent her to, I'm very fortunate to work with an amazing uh, vestibular, pediatric vestibular physical therapist. She's over at the Children's Hospital and she's the only um, certified uh, pediatric vestibular rehabilitation therapist in Florida. And it's just amazing. We, we talk frequently uh, and you know, I send a majority of my, my patients to her. And uh, at her eval, interestingly enough, this is what she found. So uh, the, the child exhibited a wide base of support with that posterior tilt. And again, as you remember her walking, she was pitched forward and that, that bottom was very much pitched backward. So it was sort of throwing off her center of gravity and kind of propelling her forward unnecessarily. Uh, she had a generalized hypotonia in upper and lower extremities with decreased postural tone in the trunk. So again, that core isn't really at, uh, engaging or, or responding the way we expect it to, to maintain balance. She had limited visual scanning abilities and this was likely secondary to our underlying visual deficits. So she has a, a pretty extensive visual um, deficit and we're not really sure what that is yet. They're, they're having challenges quantifying it just because she can't give a lot of feedback yet. Um, poor obstacle negotiation and decreased safety awareness during navigation. So when she'd approach an obstacle in her path, she would either go around it, um, attempt to step over it, but oftentimes step on it and fall. Um, and again, you know, she just, she wasn't as aware of her space. So she was frequently bumping into walls, bumping into to, to door crannies, um, bumping into different objects around her. Um, her reliance on visual input, for, uh, she had a reliance of visual input for postural stability, which is sort of fascinating because if, you know, we, we determine that her balance system is not responding very well, and we know her, she has a, an underlying, a pretty significant underlying visual deficit, but the sort of pillars of balance are vision, vestibular, and proprioception. So if proprioception is the only system that's giving, you know, potentially reliable input, that's a problem. We know that's not giving good input because she can't walk independently yet. So, um, you know, all the three systems that contribute to balance are not doing her a lot of good right now. She has delayed equilibrium and protective responses. Again, that vestibular limbic uh, connection there. And then she had frequent falls and trips during attempted, though relatively unsuccessful ambulation. So recommendations following BRT were directed vestibular therapy one to two times per week for 30 minutes at a time with focus on balance, postural control, gross motor skill acquisition, coordination, upper and lower extremity and core strength, and safety awareness. And then they also recommended a, a support of a clinical at home program. So essentially that program would be uh, designed by the therapist and then taught to mom or a caregiver so that they could then uh, utilize that or, or implement that into the home daily. So I'm very pleased to say this is Sarah five months later. So this was August of 2019. Um, I'm gonna show you the video here first. So this is her walking backwards. Now she's still very <laughs> unstable, but I mean, miles different from where she was Pero when I saw aquí. her in March. <laughs> and I'm going to show you her walking forward now. And the interesting thing is, you know, because she does have that posterior tilt, walking backwards is actually easy for her because her head naturally pitches back and that sort of compensates with the posterior tilt. So she's sort of in a C shape and that's putting her center of gravity where it should be not very efficiently, but um, it works for her. Whereas she goes forward, that, that you know, posterior tilt sticks her butt out and then she naturally pitches forward. So I'll show you that here. So notice how her head is still back. <laughs> and now Bye -bye. she has two implants as well. So she received a second implant. Um, 
about a month, two months later after I saw her for the eval. No lo creo. And now she's walking backwards there. So that is all I have. Thank you very much. That was great. Of course. So I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has any or, um, and you know, I'm also happy to uh, provide my email if anybody has any questions or wants to talk about anything offline or has specific patients, anything like that. It looks like your email, we have it on the um, calendar section. So if that's okay, I think people sure. can use that to contact you. And, and that's really great, really interesting um, talk. Thank you. It's fun stuff. <laughs>